Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Oklahoma City Board of Adjustment for Thursday, November 3rd. Um, first thing, if you have your cell phone with you, you might want to shut off the noise it makes. If I can find mine, I'll do the same. The first item of business is to accept the minutes of our previous meeting on October 20th. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to accept, to receive, what are we doing? Are we receiving? Receiving the minutes of the October 6th, is that right? I thought 20th. We're actually need to continue that to the next meeting since it wasn't properly noticed. Um, didn't catch that error on the agenda. Oops. Okay. We'll continue that item until next time. Oh, I need a motion. So moved. <laughs> second. I have a motion and a second to continue the receipt of the minutes from the October 20th Board of Adjustment meeting. Would you cast your votes, please? That motion passes. Um, we don't have any items on. We do have a, a continuance request, don't we? One continuance from the last meeting. Um, we have no continuances for this. Well, we do have one continuance. It is uh, item number five, case number 14285, to be continued to December 1st meeting. I'll make a motion to continue case number 14285 to the December 1st meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second to continue item number five, case number 14285, to the next meeting, which is what, December the 10th? Is that right? First. December 1st. December 1st. Um, if you'll cast your votes, please. That motion passes. We don't have anything on the consent agenda today, is that right? So we're on for, are, are there any requests for continuance from anyone present? Nope, I guess we're on to regular business. Item number one, case number 14279, request of Cook 02 LLC for a variance to the maximum height, building height in the 02 General Office District located at 1620 Southwest 122nd Street. Is the applicant present? I did email the applicant and did not get a response. Um, let's just move it to the end of the agenda. I'll make a motion to move to the end of the agenda for today. Can we do that? Sure. Just in case I show up. Sure. Second. I have a motion and a second to move an item, item one to the heel of the docket. Cast your votes, please. That motion carries. Item number two. Case number 14283, request of 89er Trail Fund for a variance to the maximum four square feet for public identification signs in the DBD Downtown Business and Bricktown Core Development District, located at various locations in both of those districts. Oh, I'm so glad you brought this. Yes. your name and address for the record, Certainly. Uh, my name is Chuck Wiggin, and I live at 301 Northwest 18th Street. And uh, my day job is president of Wiggin <laughs> Properties. I'm in the commercial real estate business, but uh, I have a passion for Oklahoma history. And I'm here to uh, request a variance from the ordinance that uh, governs directional signage. And let me explain how that came about. And and what these markers are all about. Um, with, the, with the help of lots of other people, uh, Bob Blackburn notably at the History Center, and uh, some other very capable historians uh, who've contributed to this effort, we have a plan to 
locate 28 historic markers, downtown in downtown and Bricktown, that tell the story of the land run of 1889. And uh, we call this the 89er Trail. Uh, it will consist of markers that uh, are located at places that are specifically related to events that occurred in that first year of the life of Oklahoma City as a new city on the prairie. And uh, as, as I'm sure everyone here can appreciate, um, even though that event is familiar to all of us, even though it was recorded in photographs, there's really very little evidence of this on the ground downtown. And yet this is the formation story of our city and the story from which everything, out of which everything else has grown over the years. So our, our plan uh, for the 89er Trail is to locate markers just like the ones you see here. These are life size, actual size. Uh, to locate these markers uh, in specific places where you'll be able to see, you'll be able to look across the street at what's there today and you'll have in front of you a picture of what was there in 1889. And, uh, and, and there will be a story that describes the particular event that's being related in this marker. And, uh, and, and strung together, these markers will weave a story of that initial chaotic year when people from all over the world rushed to grab free land not only in downtown Oklahoma City, but of course all across the unassigned lands. But this happens to be where Oklahoma City, as a city, got its start. So um, in the course of getting city approvals for this, we've been, we've gone with the help of Lisa Cronister and many others in City Hall, we've been through a process of identifying different groups and, and stakeholders uh, who are touched by these proposed markers. And we've been around to see a number of these uh, agencies get the, make a request for their approval of what we're doing. And so far we've been getting, one by one, we've been getting approvals. Uh, we've been to the Arts, Arts uh, Commission, we've been to the Park Commission, we've been to the HP Commission, we've been to uh, uh, to um, the Downtown Design Review Committee, the Bricktown Urban Design Committee, and uh, we're coming now to you because uh, we're told that that the closest thing that anyone can find to uh, a description in the ordinances of Oklahoma City of what this might be is directional signage. <laughs> now, uh, you know, we can talk about that, but but we're being asked to come here because the, the rules for directional signage say no more than four square feet for a directional sign. These measure two feet by three feet, so there's six square feet in area. Um, we think that's the right size for these markers to be able to tell the story that will be easy to read, that will be uh, visible to, um, to people who are interested in finding them and, and learning about the city's early history. And We'll present the photographs and the other graphical images that we want to show at a scale that will be easy to understand. So I'm here to ask your, to, to request your approval for a variance to permit us to um, install these signs in uh, these various locations around downtown. I'm going to fully support your application, uh, even though it's not part of our consideration. The only thing I think about is, and I'm sure it's been vetted, is just placement of the markers and the construction so that you don't have sharp edges and other things that may be a potential hazard to uh, pedestrians. But uh, I commend you on your effort and, uh, and I'm prepared to make a motion to approve if there's no other discussion or anybody I, else here. I didn't notice in uh, the materials that were provided to us that it talks about how tall they're going to be. Mm -hmm. How tall are they going to be? Uh, the, this, uh, the back of the marker will be 47 inches off the ground. So about what you've got here, yes. exactly. Okay. I have to say when I first read this, even though I'm a history buff myself and love to follow markers around, this sounded really 
big. But now that I see them, that makes perfect sense to me. And it's consistent with the National Park Service, what their signage to yes. I, I would I would also make the point that I, I don't know that that really is directional signage. I don't even know that the ordinance is on point here. I mean, it's a, it's a very unique application. I think that's pretty clear. So is, is there anyone here to speak in opposition to it? I don't believe so, no. Mr. Austin? I just wanted to also comment that I very much like what you're presenting today and the uniformity all of, and the thought that you put through it and then you had Brick County Urban Design and Downtown Design Review Committee recommend this for approval and having it be uniform not only in in the city but in tying in with the uniformity of the National Park Service I think is a wonderful idea. Great. Thank How you. will you protect the surface of them to keep people from spray painting them and well, such? That's of course very difficult to do but um, they will be fabricated with a um, out of a uh, fiberglass uh, embedded uh, board, so that the the image itself will be will be covered by a by a transparent fiberglass coating, um, and that's about as durable as we can find for a marker. He's also accepting donations for the ongoing <laughs> maintenance of those. If you're interested, um, I think it's a great project. Uh, all of us are curious about it. I have those other questions, although the only thing before us now is the variance in terms of the size. So uh, I had made a motion to approve the application. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number two, case number 14283. Would you cast your votes, please? And the motion carries. Thank Hopefully you very, this is the much. last approval you're going to need. Not quite, but we're getting there. <laughs> we're very close. Thank you very much. Actually, no revocable permit? Yes, they have to get a revocable, I'm pretty sure, with plan, uh, plan review okay. to go on the right of way. Okay. <coughs> Item number three, case number 14284, request of Allington Custom Homes, LLC, for a variance to the maximum eight foot side and rear yard fence in PUD 783 district, located at 17712 Blue Heron Court. Is the applicant present? Yes, my name is Charles Allen with Allen Engineering. Uh, Steve Allen and his superintendent Josh with uh, Allenton Homes is here also, uh, the general contractor. Uh, we're here today to ask for a variance on the eight foot side yard fence height. Uh, uh, the fence has been built, wall, fence, whatever you want to call it. Uh, at the front of the house, it's, it's approximately six feet tall. The homeowner wanted uh, the top of the fence to run level this particular lot has about 10 to 12 feet of fall from front to back. So by the time you get to the back of the, where the fence ends right now, which is actually 30 feet back from where the property ends, but uh, it's about 16 to 17 feet tall. Um, a neighbor to the, to the east complained about that. And since the wall's been built, we've, it's also been backfilled. There have been some uh, terracing built uh, on the inside. There's a lot between us and the, the neighbor that's protesting. It hasn't been built on yet. I think I sent a couple of pictures. It's being filled right now. So probably in the near future, within a year, I would say, another house will be there. Uh, the size of the wall will probably be greatly diminished. And uh, happy to answer any questions. I don't know if the protesters here. Uh, uh, comments did you get the required fence permit before you built we, the wall? We did not. Apparently there was a, a confusion. The general contractor, Allenton Homes, thought that the Mason contractor was actually getting the permit when they found out that he didn't. He tried to get the permit, which really kind of brings us here because to get the permit, after we even backfilled it, they said that they're not measuring from the top of the wall to the bottom of the wall where the ground hits. But if, it's, there's, if there's a berm, they go further out and they measure to that point. So where we measure from, we know where the top of the wall is, but we're not sure where the ground is being measured to. So um, There was a letter of protest filed. Did you get a copy of that? Yes, I did. So you've seen it? Yes. And um, the common area that yes. runs beside the house. Right. 
how is it platted? Is it platted just as open space, walkway, it's drainage? It's a, com what uh, is a it? common for a gas line. Basic, there's a gas line that runs through there, and so it's a, it's a utility easement, gas line easement, and common area. If I may, I'm Steve Allen. That is actually not necessarily a common area owned by the Rose Creek Homeowners Association, as you might find most common areas to be owned by. That is actually owned by the pipeline company. Rose Creek Homeowners Association has made an agreement to maintain that common area. And so uh, we have been in contact with the pipeline company and the backfill that has been done. They are okay with as long as they can mow it. Uh, they've given us permission to also use that common area for access to the construction site. Uh, that's immediately adjacent to the north and east of where this wall is. The issue with this wall and the reason why it was built what seems to be tall at first is we wanted to make sure that the footing was down on natural grade. And so we went down as far as we could. Uh, the pictures that uh, was just displayed recently uh, is a little bit deceiving in that we have since built a berm which matched the pre-existing berm towards the west part of the fence when before we started. And we made that berm match all the way down that property line and that berm is on in this picture right here on the right side of that column. So that berm is consistent with the slope of the pre-existing berm. Where the mouse hand is right now, that has been filled with many truckloads of dirt to make that usable space. And so what the exposure is where the mouse hand is now is approximately eight feet and six inches, seven inches in some parts of it. So the maximum exposure of the total visible wall is right now about the eight foot, six inch mark. So it goes from on the far west of the property from six feet and travels to the east. And the maximum exposure, again, is eight foot six inches. And, and Steve, you told me that the Homeowners Association is... We, a, we apply with the Homeowners Association to do this fence whenever we submitted our plans. This fence was accepted. The concern that was brought up early on was the initial height of the fence because the backfill had not been done yet. It did look like that it was a much taller fence than what the code allowed. Since the backfill has been put in place, the exposed part of the fence is that eight foot six inches. For clarification then, the Architectural Review Board did consider this before this wall was constructed? They did, and they did approve that wall to be constructed, sir. Do you have any documentation of that? Is, and is there anybody present from the Rose Creek Homeowners Association? I did not bring that to, with me today, but I'd be happy to provide that documentation of the approved plans to, that were submitted to the Rose Creek. I, I drove this neighborhood, the full neighborhood, this morning, and when you look at this document, it, it, it very clearly states that, that part of the objective for this development is that you, you have the openness, and this is the reason that the allowed fencing is a maximum of four feet, and it's, it's an open grate, and it is designed so that you have that open field between homes. And I know you cited privacy of the homeowner and some other things, but that is not consistent with, with this development and the, and the stated objectives of this development. And there are many changes in grade elevation this is an area where the, the natural terrain is rolling. And so you've got many homes that are not. And in some cases, you may have a retaining wall between properties. But I think if you had just you know, dealt with the elevation issue by, by putting a retaining wall and then complied with this and put a four foot open fence or, or no fencing at all, then you probably wouldn't be here today. We, we feel like that we would still have achieved the exact same result with a berm versus a retaining wall in that the retaining wall would have been built, we would have backfilled and then put a fence on top of it. But if, but if your retaining wall you know, was, was basically at grade and then your, then your fencing was on top of that, it would be more consistent in my view with, with the objective as outlined here. Yeah, so the, the side fence is a uh, cementuous fence. 
the rear yard fence along with the openness that is consistent with the neighborhood will be the wrought iron fence that is consistent with the other properties around the neighborhood. Madam Chairman, I think there are probably some other people that wish to speak on this matter. I'd like to hear them now. Uh, quick, quick question before they do. Um, Laura, can you clarify the section of the ordinances here at issue on the matter of the fence? Where are where does the ordinance measure from the bottom of the fence to the top of the fence? Is it from the the, gra the finished grade? Yeah, I'm going to defer to John on that one. John, well, it states you you measure from grade. Uh, I think plan review uses a policy because they don't, for fences, they don't have anything that specifies the grade on it. For housing, they do. For signs, they do. With signs, they use a 25 foot radius around the sign, and they, for policy wise, I believe that's what they're using on fences. So, in other words, you go out 25 feet to find, in that radius, and that whatever, is it an average between? those heights or is it 25 feet out so it it would be an average from 25 feet out in okay now, like I said now that is policy because when you look at fences it does not talk about it just says grade we have a definition of grade which is for housing what what is that definition for housing it's for all walls of the house you take the grade from every wall and then you that's how you get the height I think the one thing we can say for sure is that whatever the height of the wall is, simply berming, you know, soil against it does not establish a new grade elevation. Therefore, you know, that is not an accurate determination of the height of the fence. Oh. Well, um, because maybe. in this case, on one side, you've, you've got a berm that establishes an elevation of approximately 8 foot. On the other side, you've got a, an elevation of approximately 17 feet. Well, I'm curious. I mean, we, there were some pictures in our packet. Some of them were, I don't know when they were taken. They're not stamped. But um, I'm curious to know, you just commented that the, that the side of the fence where the, the, the oil and gas company's property, the other side, so it would be on the homeowner's property, are you implying now that that grade has been brought up or that ground level, I'm going to use the word grade, that yeah. ground level has been brought up? Yeah, this is a really good picture as to... Okay, when was this picture taken? Uh, just maybe in the past week, week and a half. Um, you can tell that we, we actually increased the entire grade of the backyard with many dump, tr dump, tr dump truck loads of dirt. And this is what is now what you're seeing from the, we're standing, the picture where it's being taken from is standing in that pipeline easement property, mm -hmm. looking back towards the house. And so the level of those trees that goes actually now straight back onto the property. So that's just not a berm. That's actually leveled out to where that backyard space could be usable because of the severity of the drop off in the backyard. Can I ask, are you saying that this is not a pipeline easement, but that the pipeline company actually owns that property? No, ma'am. This is, it is an easement for the pipeline, but they actually own the property. They own the common area. They, so, so the pipeline company owns the common area, is that what you're saying? They are the fee simple owner of the property. That is correct. And have you brought us any documentation about that or about their permission to you to do this? Well, the, the documentation of ownership is a public record, but the uh, documentation as far as a letter from them stating that what we have done is fine, we don't have that with us today, but we'd be happy to provide that to, them, to this body. Okay. I think we may be able to answer your question about when the other photos were taken if we ask perhaps Mr. If nobody else has any questions, the applicant. This I just want to double check on, uh, so in your uh, PED documents and in your uh, site plans and everything, you are required to get a building permit for this wall that is or correct. whoever it was, and you all did not secure one. Did not secure one. So when we did not secure one, we, when that, we found that out, we immediately stopped production and did go secure one. The city came out to take a look at the wall. And we also had Mr. Allen here come out as a structural engineer and go out and certify that that was actually built to code for a cementuous type fence. But uh, you all ended up backfilling the berm. Is that what you're saying? When you realized it was too tall? That was the plan all along, man. was to backfill. And this is a good picture here. You can see that 
behind those trees, that is now going back level, whereas before it was just taking a severe drop off. So what is exposed today from the in interior of the fence and the exterior of, fen of the fence at the farthest point uh, towards those trees is eight feet, six inches. Okay, so. Um, Where it touches dirt. Okay, from the inside of the deal, the inside of that wall on the, on the property the underside. On, in, on the interior wall of the property line, there's a little retaining wall there, and then that wall is exposed from the top of the retaining wall up. On the exterior, it is the dirt going up to the eight foot mark. I guess the, other, the only other question I would have, what, what is it that you are claiming is the hardship here? I'm not sure that we're particularly claiming hardship per se. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that terminology on our claim. Okay. Probably, probably the hardship would be understanding where the wall is being measured, top of the wall to the ground. Is, are we measuring at the base of the wall, 25 feet out in average? Does so we're, we're asking for, I guess, a hardship is where do we measure from? And does the radius, is that on the exterior of the wall? Is that in the center of the wall? So does that mean it's 12 feet on either side of the wall? Well, the, the, so, so the hardship would be the code requires that the fence not exceed eight feet in height. Correct. We're going to, we get to have an interesting discussion about what grade means in a minute. But so what would be the hardship? Your fence by admission exceeds eight feet in height. So what would be the hardship that we, that we would consider for granting a variance, which is pretty well, essential? We would, well, once the grade decision is determined, we're happy to further build the grade so that the exposure rate is correct at eight foot, but we're not sure what the actual rule is because we're kind of getting different answers, as you say, as to what the measurement point is for the height of the fence. Well, let me ask this then, and we know on one side we've got the photographic evidence of the berm up against the wall. From the top of the, the fence or the top of the wall to the ground on the opposite side of the wall, what would that dimension be? On the top, on the inside of the wall, it's eight foot from the top of the wall to the top of the area where we have a retaining wall, because we built a retaining wall inside to build that grade up as well. And that retaining wall stands about probably two and a half, three feet. So on, so on the, on the side of the, the wall or the side of the fence where the home is, yes. you're saying right next to that fence, there is a, a separate retaining wall? And then what is the elevation from grade to the top of that retaining wall? And then from that retaining wall, what I'm saying is, it's like if, if I dig a hole three feet deep and I stand in it, it doesn't make me three feet tall. And if the wall is 17 or 18 or whatever it happens to be, and you simply push soil up against it and create a new elevation, that does not make the wall eight feet any more than digging and standing in a hole makes me three feet tall. That's the point. But if we build a retaining wall, fill the lot is that our grade I mean if we tear this wall down leave up leave it cut it off at the ground level move back one foot and build an eight-foot fence we're fine what I would suggest is if you're dealing with an elevation difference where you need a retaining wall right between your property and your next-door neighbors as you build that retaining wall and that it tops out basically at grade and then you comply with the guidance in this document that says you, know, you put nothing higher than four foot and it's an open metal to to keep the you know the aesthetics of the neighbor as, as I, 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 I appreciate that that argument and I'm I'm I, I'm with you on the grade perspective I can I can assure you that the intent of the ordinance wasn't to establish grade by picking how high you wanted to pile dirt and putting sod on it and calling that grade we, we can be pretty clear that that wasn't the intent of the ordinance but we have two issues here that I want to clearly separate. One of those is what the CC&Rs of the Neighborhood Association is going to govern, and those are private rights that can be enforced and have nothing to do with us. And the other is the variance that we're being asked to discuss, which is the, that this fence exceeds the maximum height requirement somewhere between six inches and nine feet, depending on how we want to establish or interpret the word grade. So I, 
the, the HOA is a whole separate thing, no matter what we do, I'm sure you're aware of this. If somebody has private rights within those uh, covenants and restrictions to prevent that wall from remaining, they have the right to enforce those. That's got nothing to do with us. Right. But to your point, I think that should have been something that you probably considered uh, before you, you built it if it wasn't, there wasn't anything like that in the neighborhood, and I think that's your point. Is that fair? Uh, I have a comment, too, on your application. Um, you did say your hardship. Uh, I think you were talking about the privacy issue. Um, and uh, so um, you said substantial detriment after the construction. The wall would only be visible from the common area. But staff, uh, in the unfavorable consideration, said the requested variance in height is over twice what the code permits. So that finding at least is in our staff report. If I may just make a quick comment of clarification, because I think it's important to note in this situation, um, on the other side, where we're talking about the pipeline property being, then there's a lot right next door adjacent. That pad has been built up to date has not been built on, but that pad has been built up to date, which is apparently almost level with our berm on the other side. And I was there this morning, and I can confirm that. But to me, that still doesn't justify what you've done. But I'm talking about the great issue being is the privacy from that house now has been lifted up into the air, so to speak, by virtue of a backfilled berm on the pad, and so now the privacy issue that the homeowner was concerned about is their ability next door to be able to see directly into their backyard. But that's a choice. I mean, there, there are many homes that are that are sited next door to each other where the elevation of the homes is different uh, because of the, the terrain. And having seen it also this morning, I can say that it doesn't seem to me that the grade of the lot next door has by any means been established. There were oh, a lot the, of piles the, of dirt on it. There but. is fill there, but, but that's that's the option to uh, to raise, you know, the grade level of, of where your construction is. I mean, you, there's no reason that I know of that you couldn't build a home at the, you know, the natural grade. You have a retaining wall if you need it. Uh, you deal with your drainage issues. But it's, you know, but whoever owns that lot has, the, has I guess, the prerogative of, of, you know, adding some fill. Shall we hear from... Um, Mr. Snyder. Yes, ma'am. You can refer to me as a, as a protester if you'd like. Um, I'm, I'm not actually alone in this. Uh, my house is the house that is two doors down from that, but also here we have the owner of the lot that's adjacent to it, the one with the, uh, the fill dirt present currently. Uh, he can explain if you'd like. So, the house in question, There's the common lot, area. An empty lot. And then My you? house okay. is being constructed, and we should be moved in in a couple of weeks. Um, as for the common area, I'd like to correct the record a little bit, and I think the property records for the county will show this. The common area is actually, in fact, owned by Rose Creek. Oh, before we start, will you give us your name and address for the record? For Sean the Snyder. And address? 17800 Blue Heron Court. Thank you. The common area is owned by Rose Creek. The county property records will show that the pipeline company does have an easement on that property which restricts what sort of construction and building can be done on that common area. Uh, but it is just an easement and that's what the property records would reflect. I, I don't have those with me. I didn't think that would be something that would be addressed, but uh, a quick search of the Oklahoma County property records will reflect that it is owned by Rose Creek. Uh, the sec second thing I'd like to address that I heard um, stated earlier that I think was inaccurate was that the Homeowners Association approved the wall. Initially, the building guidelines that were referenced refer to a open fencing re as the requirement for um, properties next to common areas such as this one. A variance was requested for an eight-foot um, fence, privacy fence along that line. That variance was granted. What wasn't requested was a variance from the other portions of the building guideline, which do define what um, constitutes grade. In our Rose Creek guidelines, it says that existing grade is what the grade of the fence should be. There was no variance requested for that. Uh, so in my opinion, Rose Creek has not approved 
um, this wall. Um, but I do understand that's not the issue and that's not what you're here to address. What you are is whether, here to address is whether or not they've met the statutory requirement for granting a variance. In this case, they have not. They could not articulate a, a reasonable answer as to what the um, unnecessary hardship would be. They claim privacy would be the hardship. But I ask you, if, if you've been out there today, you, you saw the, the back of that property is adjacent to a large green belt and open lake, which faces, by my count, 16 homes. So even with the wall, which exists today, we're not talk, talking about a hypothetical wall. This wall exists. It's very much there. If you take my concerns, my views out of it, we're left with a wall that exists but doesn't alleviate the privacy concerns which, which they cite in their application. There are 16 homes surrounding that lake that have direct views into their backyard. There is no privacy there. Uh, so again, as for the undue hardship, that doesn't exist. Uh, they can't prove that and they haven't done so. The second element that they have the burden of proving that they haven't proved is that their lot has some peculiar condition. It's a unique condition that exists on that property that, al that should allow them to get a variance uh, on the ordinances. There is nothing peculiar about a slope lot, a lot that slopes less than half an inch from front to back. Uh, there's also <clears throat> nothing peculiar about your neighbors being able to see into your backyard. We can all think of the situation where uh, you have a backyard fence that's eight feet in height, but you've got a neighbor that has a two-story home with a window. They can see in your backyard. The third element that they have to prove that they haven't proven is that they uh, the granting of the variance itself would, would not be at odds with the policy or intent of the ordinance at issue. In this case, it's an eight-foot wall. Uh, they talk a lot about aesthetics and privacy, but they don't address what I have a bigger concern about, which is safety. I have a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. that Those kids are going to grow up two doors down. Uh, we're going to live in that house until we um, have to move out or I can't keep it clean. So. Safety is my concern, and if you look at this picture here, you'll actually see what they have next to the, the very end of this wall, the tallest portion of the wall, is they built a basketball court with a concrete slab that if, if a child climbed up on that wall, now I, I, granted, it's going to be difficult to climb on that portion of the wall, but the lower portion on the front is very easy to climb up onto. If a child who, and if you look at that one right there next to the tree, you'll see it's even less than six feet. As it's closer to the driveway, it's probably approximately three feet in height. Uh, my three-year-old probably can't climb up on that, but I bet a seven-year-old could. And climbing up on that portion of the wall allows you easy access to traverse all the way to the far end, which is the highest part of the wall, which is immediately adjacent to a concrete slab, a slab that if a child falls off of that wall, taken aside, they shouldn't be there. Uh, Granted, I'll, I'll, I will tell my kids, don't climb that wall. But I can't promise that the neighborhood kids won't. And if they fall off of that wall, let's hope they fall on the side that's dirt. Because if they fall, fall on the side that's cement, we're going to have ourselves a serious problem. Uh, going beyond that, so that's the safety concern. That's part three. They haven't proven it. The fourth and final issue is that are there lesser means to um, alleviate this hardship that they claim? Now, I don't believe that they have a hardship. I don't think privacy is really actually a concern that they have, but let's assume for a second that it is. If privacy is their concern, the lesser means to alleviate that undue hardship of privacy would be doing what, what they've attempted to, to do partly there, which is plant some trees. But trees and bushes can be planted. Those can be done within the, uh, the confines of the city ordinances. Um, and they can have an eight-foot wall built from ground level. So again, there are lesser means available. They can't prove that there are not and that this is the least restrictive means. Therefore, they can't prove that either. So we're left with they have four elements to prove. They can't prove one by my count, but they certainly can't prove four. Uh, their inability to prove one it makes their application fatal. Uh, as such, at this time, um, I do have one other thing. I'm not alone in this. As I mentioned earlier, my neighbor, he, he lives in the completed house uh, to the east of mine. Um, he also owns the property that is the lot that has the dirt built up on it. Uh, he has built some of the other homes uh, in our part of the neighborhood and has actually um, discussed with those neighbors their objections to this wall as well. Uh, they weren't able to be here, but they did sign um, a letter uh, 
with their address and signature showing their objection, and I'd like to provide that to you all for consideration. <laughs> May I approach? I pointed to you, Jeff. <laughs> Before we go any further, I, uh, there's one last thing that I wanted to say. As this hearing approached, I had a concern that what we might actually hear is, is or, hear or you all might think is that uh, they already built this wall. So that the, there would be an undue hardship on them if, if they were required to comply with the statute. And, and I think I'm, I'm seeing nods, so I'm sure you know what I know, which is the Oklahoma Supreme Court has said a self-imposed hardship is not a hardship. So any costs that they have imposed on themselves by ignoring my objections since the construction of this, by failing to ignore the city's uh, ordinances requiring them to get a permit, um, is, is something they've done on themselves and should not be a consideration. Uh, I want to thank you for the time and, and allowing me to complain. Um, and my wife and I would like to respectfully ask that you all uh, deny their variance at this time. Members of the board, have any questions, Mr. Snyder? Not at this time. Is there anybody else who'd like to be heard here today on this matter? Could you come forward and give us your name and address, please, for the record? My name is J. Christopher Sturm, S-T-U-R-M. Uh, I reside at 17220 Hawks Ridge Lane, which is in Rose Creek. I back onto this property. So when I stand out on my back porch. Across the lake? That's correct. When I stand on my back porch, I not only can see through their entire backyard, I can actually see right through their front door. So there is no privacy for them or for us. When this wall was first started and under construction, I can tell you everybody in the neighborhood was startled. It started out at the very front of the street as a very low wall. But on a crash program, it progressed towards the back. And when it got to the very last post, I personally went over and measured it. And from the ground where they poured the slab, to the top of the wall, to the little capstone, was in excess of 20 feet, almost 22 feet. And when they talk about how tall this wall is, I find it novel that they can come in here and tell you that that wall is eight feet, even with the berm. Because I went over just yesterday and measured from the top of the, bur of the wall to the bottom of what you're looking at right here. And that is, at the present time, 10 feet 4 inches exposed on the outside. <clears throat> and that's with all this dirt piled up at a rather steep angle. As that settles, that wall is going to be taller. But no matter how you look at it, there is at least 10 to 12 feet of that wall that's buried below that they altered the the contour uh, of, of that lot to try to disguise what they're what they're doing it's truly a sham when they came before the property of, of the homeowners association and asked for a, a, a variance it seemed like an innocuous privacy fence that everyone considered would be following the contour of the, of the properties as they were, the original contour. No one ever envisioned any kind of a monstrosity or a wall that would be this tall. And there are no other examples of such a wall or any kind of a structure that has been allowed or built in Rose Creek. I want to thank you very much for your time and, and, and for your consideration. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have, I have to say, you know, I was as I was reading through these documents. Um, I, I think everybody can certainly um, sympathize with the desire to have some privacy in one's own backyard, and even the idea that what they really wanted, rather than privacy, was a basketball court is not particularly offensive to me as the mother of a basketball player, but um, 
And, if, and I, I, have, I kept thinking to myself that if I had to have cast a vote on this application as a member of the architectural committee, I'm not quite sure where I would have come down. But that's not my job. Um, I did go out and look at the property today. I can't say I drove every single street in Rose Creek, but I didn't see anything else that looked anything like this. Um, it, it is clearly designed and intended to be a very, and I mean very, open uh, development. There are very few fences of any kind, um, and there are a number of um, short uh, wrought iron railing kinds of barriers. I guess to keep dogs in and kids out, but um, uh, I mean, it seemed to me that the whole point of the neighborhood was how open it is, where there are sight lines not merely from one's own back door down to the, to the creek or the lake that your house happens to be sitting next to, of which there are several, uh, but you know, maybe across the street and over there, and you can still see it. So. Um, in the end, I was able, luckily, to come back to, you know, what we're here to do, which is to determine whether this application meets the statutory criteria for the grant of a variance. And that was a very easy decision for me, because I do not think it does. Um, I don't think there's any showing of hardship. I don't think there's even really a plausible claim for hardship. Um, certainly there's not anything peculiar about this piece of property within the context of the development where it sits, or maybe even the state of Oklahoma generally. Um, it's pretty flat here, but, you know, we have a little bit of contour. Uh, and there's nothing, nothing remarkable about this particular setting in that way. Um, I can't imagine having, you know, being able to make an argument that it's the least necessary um, which of course hinges back to relieving the hardship, which I don't see that there is. So, uh, I, this is a very clear case for me. It is for me too. And if the, you know, as soon as we've concluded our discussion and questions, I am prepared to make a motion. Hi. If I might, I just, just one question real quick. I mean, the direction we're going is, you know, if it's going to be denied, that's fine. But I, I guess we don't want to lose the whole wall, tear it down. So I, I guess I'm kind of concerned or question, what, where do we measure grade from? Well, I think, you know, that's a fairly easily answered question by people that do that kind of thing. Okay. But um, the, the, grade, the, the grade of the, of the property next door, which is common area, right. seemed pretty clear to me. But, but we've talked about building a retaining wall. So if I'm going to cut off the top eight feet of this wall and leave the remaining wall in the ground as a retaining wall, then I could come back and submit for a permit for an eight-foot open fence, whatever the fence is, and put an eight-foot fence on top of this wall. That's not what we're saying. Let's uh, look at well, I, Exhibit I, I, 14, I the photograph that. Exhibit 14 in your packet. But to adjust the I think grade everybody understands that if there's a retaining wall that's, that, that is necessary, in your view, to deal with grade elevations between the, the two I different lots, that's, that's one, one thing. And, and to extend their backyard or something like that. That's not just to build the house. They may want to have a patio out there. If we want to fill the whole lot in, we can put a retaining wall around it. Is that not we can't do that. I'm not going to represent the city, but I, I, I think, you know, you know, common sense says that if a retaining wall is necessary in the view of, a, of, a, of an engineer to deal with a, an elevation you know, I, difference I, from I'm one. I'm not sure this is our job, Charlie. I understand. Okay. So. But, I mean, but that's what we are arguing about is, is where are we measuring the top of the yeah, wall Yeah, that's from? not what we're here to do, and we're not if arguing. We're not yeah. arguing. Okay. okay. But we wouldn't be here if the ordinance clearly state where we measure from the top of the wall 
too great. Well, wait a minute. Great. What would have happened if you would have presented a permit to the city to build this wall to begin with? Well, that's where the confusion comes Well, but at that point, that's where that discussion gets had. And that's right. her point, is when you go back and you submit a permit, if there are questions at that time, the ordinances are reviewed, the codes are looked at, those things are discussed then. That's exactly right. And, and before same. that happens, where you're in a position where you have to remove a wall that doesn't right. comply with the code, you're, yeah. you, you, you get that chance. That, that, that was the step that got missed. That's, that's right. And that's fine. I mean, we, you know, if somebody could tell me that I could build a retaining wall and then one foot behind it, I could build another eight foot wall. Well, and, and what I'm telling you, is, that. it's not our job to tell you that. I understand. There's a process and you yep, should follow it. I understand that. It. But when I go to the There's permit, a process and you should follow it. I understand that. I go to the permit department, talk to Mike Miller. He says our policy is to measure 25 feet out, however far out. But if there's a berm there, we require you to go and get a variance. And that's why we're, even if the wall weren't here today, that we would be like here. That seems like plain English to me. But if you want to take the chance of trying again and coming back here, I suppose that's. Well, I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to if I had a clear definition of where grades measured from. It seemed like a pretty clear definition to me, Charlie. 25 feet out or at the bottom of the wall? Clearly not the bottom of the wall. All right, at the fence. I can't build a retaining wall then. What part of we're not arguing about this do you not understand? Well, just, okay. We're done talking. I just don't know if I'm measuring from the bottom. Do I have the, a motion? You do have a motion, but I would simply say, sir, that they were telling you if you had followed the process, then the issue of, you know, correct elevation and height of the wall wouldn't be ambiguous. And, you wouldn't and, be and I want to be clear that I'm not, at least, I'm not making light of the fact that you guys built a wall and whether or not you did it intentionally, I'm not passing judgment on right. that. That's got nothing to do with it. Our, our job is to look at these four elements and okay. see. And I don't necessarily agree with all of the arguments that were made by your protesting on the elements and whether or not certain elements exist or don't exist, but the one that's really crystal clear in this instance is you have not defined or articulated an, an unnecessary hardship, and that precludes us from doing anything except, frankly, in my view, denying the application. Okay. Mr. Craig, it's not to belabor the point, but you had asked, I think, a pretty important question <clears throat> early on, and that was is if we had got the permit initially, then would we even be here today? And no, the answer is no on that, because I do not need a permit to backfill a lot. I do not need a permit to bring fill into a lot. I must retain dirt on a lot by virtue of a retaining wall or an option thereof or a three to one slope on dirt that you can mow. There is a rule on that. But the issue is, is that we had a problem with, well, where are we going to measure it from? Are we measuring it from the grade at the bottom of the wall? Are we measuring it 25 feet out? That was unclear to us. Had we done this all over, we would have built that entire thing up with dirt initially. We would have made sure that that grade goes out 25 feet. And the exact same of thing, a wall that you see today is exactly what we would have built and we would have been in compliance with the code as it is today. The biggest question of today is, is the variance as to, or the clarification as to where are we taking the tape measure from? Is it from the bottom of the dirt that meets the wall up or is it the 25 foot mark out going up vertically as well? I get it, and I think that we're ready to move on, but we both, I have been down to the permit office plenty of times to get commercial permits, and at that time I sit down with the people and staff and planning, and we go over my drawings and my designs and my issues, and we work through these things, and they bring them up, and they tell me where I have problems. Yeah. And at that point, I have to make adjustments, and I go back and I look and I see what my options are, and there very well could have been an option for you to go back and regrade that lot and do the things that are in the confines of the code. In this instance, that's not what happened. And it, it, it's, it's very troubling to go to somebody and say, you can't keep the wall. It doesn't work. It, that's painful. But at the end of the day, that's within the confines of what we can look at, which is not Rose Creek guidelines. That's not, I don't care what those say, frankly. It's not because I don't care personally, but because I don't care in this position. What I care is there's no hardship. And it's, I, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'd make a motion to deny the application. A second. I have a motion and a second to deny item three, case number, find <laughs> something that's got my case number on it. Case number 14284, 
Would you cast your votes, please? And it is denied. Item number four, case number 14286, request of Megan Monroe for a variance to the maximum sign square footage allowed for accessory signs in PUD 262 district located at 7860 Northwest Expressway. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for the time. My name is Megan Monroe, uh, address 1700 South Walton Boulevard in Bentonville, Arkansas, 72712. Uh, again, my name is Megan Monroe, and I am here to represent Harrison French and Associates, the architect on record for the auxiliary use building located at 7860 Northwest Expressway. That is in the Supercenter parking field uh, located at 7800 Northwest Expressway. Uh, we're here to request from the board a variance from Chapter 3, uh, Article 5, signs as regulated by zoning code. Uh, the building itself operates uh, and serves the online grocery pickup service that the Supercenter provides, as you'll see by the unique uh, elevations of the building. Uh, signage is required on all four sides to instruct customers how to use the building. Uh, simply, the request is for uh, an excess of 192 square feet from allowable. Uh, allowable sign code uh, permits us to have 572 square feet of signage, or sorry, excuse me, 380 square feet of signage. We're requesting 572 square feet of signage at the building uh, for the building sign code. Uh, I have with me uh, David Ewing from Walmart here to explain the building, the unique design and function of the building, uh, and the request for the hardship. Um, I have a question. Um, it's a little unclear to me whether the variance that they're seeking is from uh, the city's code requirements or from the PUD? Well, it's in the PUD, but the PUD uh, describes what zoning they go by, and in that they're going over the square footage. I see. And what is that? Do you know? What is the underlying? The base district. The base district. The base district? I don't have it in front of me. I apologize. Okay. I believe it's C3. But Probably. I believe it's C3. It's, I don't have it in front of me. PUD 262 is pretty old. So, okay. We'll, we'll guess it's C3. We'll go with that. Okay. Um, are there Maybe questions from... Way <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have to say, uh, this whole building is a sign. I mean, ever since they started putting it up, and certainly once they started putting paint on it, you know, every time I drive by it, I, what is that? So I'm not sure it really requires any additional signage to call attention to it. Um, and frankly, I'm myself personally not inclined to give him any additional signage to call attention to it. But um, I'd be pleased to hear comments from the other members of the board. No comments? No comments. Well, then I'll entertain a motion. Would you, would you like me to explain the project and why? I, you know, okay. it, it seems fairly self-explanatory, actually, and that more to my point. It, it doesn't really require that much explanation, I don't think. Th this is, my, here's my one question. So all four sides of the building have signage. The side that faces um, the Walmart store also has signage, is that correct? Yes, that has a mirror image of the street signage. And first, a little background history so you know how we got to signing all four sides. Uh, generally, I would prefer to sign the, sign the road side and maybe the entry side, just the smaller side of the building. The issue we had here is we had multiple uh, focus groups on this project since it was a new format. This is the first one in the country of this. So it's the, the online grocery pickup that we have now that we've implemented in about nine stores in the metro Oklahoma uh, city market. Uh, the difference on this one is it's fully automated and unmanned. So this is the only one in the country like that. Uh, the, the process works, you know, the customer orders their groceries online, somebody in the store gets that order, they go pull it, put it in a tote, when the customer arrives, they will take that tote, carry it out to the car, and load it into the car. At this site, what's different in that scenario is instead of the associate carrying it and putting it in the customer's car, 
the, custom, the associate will load it into a refrigerated truck, drive it across the parking lot, and put it in this box, which is refrigerated. The, the challenge we had with it was during the focus groups, one of the consistent comments that we got is just having a building in a Walmart parking lot, they felt that they wouldn't know that you could pick up groceries there. They would think it was an ancillary use uh, building that you just use for storage and merchandise, those kind of things. So what we did, we took that information back, back. We had several focus groups, and that was a consistent message. We took that information back with marketing, worked it up, and came up with this, this signage here. The reason why we have the signage on the back side of the building on this, that doesn't face the road is also so that the customer will learn how to use the box. There's going to be a learning curve because it's not another one of these in the country where they've been able to go in and, and use. Uh, so we know that's a challenge going into this facility. And that's one of the reasons we put the pickup on it so that they would know what the building was, the URL, so go to this web address to place your order. And then, the, the, of course, the standard proto messaging we have with your order schedule pickup so that people would understand what, what you, uh, how it would operate. Uh, we did try to minimize the signage as much as we possibly could to try to scale it down. I managed to get this project designed completely with maintenance help too. Uh, our, our goal coming into it was not to ask for any variances, just get it where it completely complies with code, uh, complies with our ECR parties, which unlike the last case, hopefully this was a little easier. Uh, no issues there. We're in complete compliance there. And so we were trying to do everything we could uh, to, to not ask for variances. All. This was the one issue where I couldn't seem to get marketing passed. Can we do some smaller signs? Can we do something? But after all the focus groups that they had been through, that's where the hard, uh, the hard part came in. How do we message this to the customer so that the customer knows how to use the box, knowing we're going to have to do some ongoing training to get it sort of up and running? So on, what, on your, I'm sorry. So what you're saying, this is a unique designed for, uh, you, you're kind of a one of a kind, so this is a unique purpose. Correct. Right. For now, and the signage uh, is to allow people coming from the street as well as other people who might be from behind, because uh, they might not understand and need some direction. And how big is that parking lot, which is adjacent to it, the Walmart park? It's pretty big, right? It so that street's big. fairly confusing if you get on the highway. As we went through this project, Internally, when we were trying to decide where to put it, that was one of the, the big topics of conversation is how do we get customers in and out of the site safely over to the building because there's, there's not, you know, while there's several entrances, it's, it's, and I'm sure for somebody that lives here and goes to the store often, they know how to zip right into the parking lot. Uh, for me, when I came from out of town and went to the parking, to the store, it's like, okay, well, this one is only a right in, right out. This one's a three-quarter access. The, your signal is over here on this side of the property. So we did want to make it very clear for that. And then we put it in an area in the parking lot to try to minimize the disturbance of not only the customers at the store, but to ensure that we did not interfere with any of the other businesses around us. It is the, on your drawing that you submitted, um, there's some of what you guys have shown as applied graphics. That doesn't count toward signage, does it? There are no words on that, so no, it was it was decided by the city that it was not signage. It was not signage. signage. Mm -hmm. So what's being counted as signage is where on the on the left and right elevations, on the right elevation it's just your Walmart logo. On the left elevation it's the pickup, uh, order schedule, pick that that all counts as signage. And then on the front elevation it's the Walmart and then on the back of the elevation it's the same thing. What is your do you know uh, and I'm just I can't quite make these numbers out on this this printout. Your rear elevation, what is the total signage, square footage there, that, that I guess that the city? It's 223.82 square feet in signage. The, the one piece of signage that you did not call out on there, that is the 24 hour. It's on the little hatch pieces that oh. are there on the side. There's a pickup here so that they know when to pull up. This is the spot you go to to touch the keypad to, to get your merchandise. Well, you know, I, I can certainly understand that you, that there will be some learning curve if this is the very first one of these ever, um, and that you're going to have to educate people about how to use it. I don't think necessarily that signage is the right way to go about that, but. I, I guess my, I mean, my, my only, the only thing to me that makes this unique is that the signage ordinances are trying to avoid 
overly large signs on frontage and things that are, you know, it, this is, we've got signage that nobody sees unless you're going in and out of the Walmart. And if you take that out, that's 192 square feet of the total signage. So, I mean, they're, st they're still over the variance limit. And that's the only thing that I think is different. This is not, and I get that we, you know, in, in what I would compare it to, frankly, at least in my mind, and looking at this is it's almost like directional signage. And we, you know, we, we hold people accountable to those ordinances the same way that I think we, you know, we, we're holding you accountable to it. But that's the thing about this that makes it unique for me is that it's not, it's signage that faces Walmart. It's not signage that faces a street or obstructs traffic or creates visibility problems or, you know, something like that. So, I mean, I'm, I would, I guess, I'm a little nervous that you could make it smaller and that, you know, Janice's point is maybe we're not giving you the minimum necessary to alleviate the hardship. We're asking for more than that. Um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, you know, support the application, but I, I, I would rather see that you guys have made a better effort to comply just because it is, it, it's quite a bit over that, that threshold uh, of what the ordinance allows. There's nothing that you can change. You guys have gone over this and this is it. In, internally? I have spent hours arguing with marketing over signage on the site trying to avoid a board barrier. I really wanted to come in and not have to ask for anything to get this box up and running. And that was one of the reasons we even chose Oklahoma City when we were going through everything was the permitting process. Can we build this test concept here without going through six or eight months of hearing the various process? I, I will tell you, I, that was probably one of my more challenging Marketing. They have their own timeline of how they work things. And if, if I tell them a deadline, then it was pushing them back to try to get something out of them to do this. But I can assure you, there is, I bet you, a good 10 or 15 different renderings where I tried to get them to fall back into code compliance on that piece of it. I'm sure he doesn't mean to suggest that the Oklahoma City, that we're pushovers here when it comes to science. <laughs> It's not how I interpreted it. Well, I will say, oh, since you made that comment, I, you know, I have to defend it somehow, though. We, our customers in Oklahoma City and the entire metro here have been very supportive of the online grocery pickup. So that, that of course, plays into the equation. Second piece would be this site, which is, could be good or bad for me, depending on which uh, side of the bed some people wake up on. My executives can drive over to this site from Bentonville and see how I'm doing with it. <laughs> I know the Bell Isle Walmart has has created some new signage on the corner of the building, and I see you know them bringing groceries right out the side of the building. So I'm assuming that this is designed potentially to replace that method of online Correct. ordering there, and pickup. This is the only one of these we have planned now. We'll run it for a while to see how it works and if there, there is true customer acceptance of it. Um, the, where you've seen the orange painted on the side of the building and all that, that's our standard proto that we're implementing in various markets all across the country. Right Just to the side, I mean, it seems more laborious to, you know, load it on a truck, drive the truck to this building, and, and then, you know, inventory it and offload it, process orders, as opposed to just carrying it straight out of the large store into the parking lot and you've got designated parking. I mean, that, that's obviously not what's before us today, but, I just, but I'll support the application. I share the concerns of my other board members, but I will support the application. Is that a motion? Make a motion to approve the application. Second. I have a motion to approve the application. Would you cast your votes, please? And it passes. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you all at it soon. <laughs> just a reminder, too, we had uh, deferred our Item number one, which we push to the end of the docket. Could we consider just making a motion to uh, continue it and uh, allow the city to provide another notification to the applicant? Our next meeting is December 1st. I would entertain that motion, although frankly. This, is, this is, was a return visit, and I think it was pretty clear that we were going to oppose this and that the option is is they can either reduce the overall height of the building or they can move it. I, 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 given the conversation we had before, I mean, I'm 
I would be perfectly fine if we denied the application. I just think that's bad policy. Um, I, I'd be comfortable making the motion, in other words, but I think that's bad policy. I just think that we should give them a notice and let them come back, and if they're not here, I mean, we've had that precedent before of people not showing up and time after time. So I'll, I'll make a motion to continue uh, case number 14279 to December the 1st. Second. I have a motion and a second to continue item number one. Uh, case number 14279, would you cast your vote? And uh, continue it until December the 1st. Would you cast your votes, please? And that motion carries. Item number six, the adoption of the uh, 2017 Board of Adjustment meeting schedule. Feels funny to be talking about 2018 at this point, but uh, I would make a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the 2017 calendar for regularly scheduled meetings of the Oklahoma City Board of Adjustment. Would you cast your votes, please? And it carries. There's no so, other business. I would make a motion to adjourn. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? or? Nope. Nothing to second. I have a motion to say to adjourn. Cast your votes, please. Mr. Austin's ready to get out of here. I don't know why, but it looks at me whenever. <laughs>